How's it going, guys? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, good. So uh, it's really fun to be here. Like, like you just heard, I've been in, in your seat. It was like nine or ten years ago. And uh, this was like one of my favorite classes. So I hope you guys like it. I learned today that I'm the first speaker. So hopefully I don't put anyone to sleep today. I'll try and like move around a little bit. Maybe that kind of keeps you on your toes. Um, but um, this was easily one of my favorite classes that I took at BYU. I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to be an entrepreneur at some point in my life. Had no idea what I was going to do. Just knew that this like, seems kind of interesting, kind of fun. I'll elaborate on that a little bit more in a few minutes. But um, it was always really cool to come to this room, listen to different entrepreneurs that have come through these doors, attended BYU, been in your same seat, it felt like super real to me that, hey, this might actually be within reach. This guy, it sounds like his story could be similar to mine. Maybe I'm even like, maybe I come from even better circumstances. Maybe I have an even better shot of making it. Um, so it was a, a cool confidence builder for me, for me I think. But um, I do have some bad news for you. Um, I will guarantee you that I am the least impressive entrepreneur that will speak to you this semester. Um, I have done some interesting stuff. I guarantee you that you have better speakers lined up that have done cooler stuff. But uh, to, to compensate for that, I've got a, a presentation here. About a third of my slides will either make you laugh, make you think I have a really crappy sense of humor, or they'll give you a headache, and you'll see why in a little bit. Um, but uh, let's, let's go ahead and get started. I'm interested who here is an entrepreneur already. You've like started a business, it's running right now. Raise your hands real high. Okay, so a decent number. Who's convinced that they'd like to be an entrepreneur one day? Who's like, dude, that doesn't sound very interesting, sounds really stupid, but this might be kind of interesting stuff to hear anyways? Okay. So the last group's right. The last group's right. <laughs> Running a business, it's miserable, man. It's hard. It's really, really hard to get like an idea to the point of actually being a viable business where you're like, I think this is working. But I'll tell you this, even when you think it's working, it's super not working. It's, it's, really, it's really hard to get a business to a point where you're like, we're in the clear. We're, we're good to go. Those of you who think they'd like to be entrepreneurs or are entrepreneurs, why? Shout out why you're an entrepreneur or why you want to be. Yeah. What? Be your own boss, okay? I was going to say, I don't want to work in a cubicle under the man for the rest of my life. Okay. Those are, those are responses we hear pretty often. What else? Flexible schedules. Flexible schedules. That's a myth. What else? Shape the world. Shape the world. Okay, I like it. I say flexible schedules is a myth because... I, I uh, landed in entrepreneurship, avoiding investment banking. I guarantee you I put in more hours as an entrepreneur. Sorry, you had your hand up? Job security. Job security, also a myth, <laughs> especially as an entrepreneur. You're signing up for like no guarantees and no money. All right, what else? Solve a problem. Solve a problem? Okay, I'm going to state the one that I know all of you are thinking, but you feel guilty saying it. You want to make money, right? And a lot of it. And you think entrepreneurs probably do that. Don't lie. Raise your hand if that's at least some of the reason. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. All right. So being an entrepreneur is super hard on a family. It's super hard on a marriage. It's super hard on your health. When I was in the thick of, of running Grow Social, I weighed about 35 pounds more than I weigh right now. I was going through some pictures that I was going to put in this deck, and my wife and I were looking at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, look at you. Things have changed a little bit. I've tried to get my health under control. Um, but you work, and then you work, and then you work, and then you sleep for a minute, and then you get up and work again. And you kind of have to in many cases. And I don't say that as like a badge of honor. It's actually like really dark days sometimes when I look back at it. But I'm going to get into some of that. Um, I've been asked a, uh, a bunch of questions since Grow Social sold to a business called Infusionsoft. I'll tell you a little bit more about both of these businesses in a minute. But 
Um, one of the questions that I get asked repeatedly is some flavor or twist on this. Um, what decision or decisions did you make that helped you be successful as an entrepreneur? Um, I've thought about this question over and over and over again um, over the past like four or five years, mainly because I've been asked that question in a number of different ways over the years. And uh, I've concluded that the answer to that question, it actually has nothing to do with the decisions I made after Grow Social was kind of up and running. The decisions I made sometimes weren't decisions that I made, sometimes they were decisions that my dad or mom made and forced upon me because they raised me. Um, other times they were decisions that I made as a kid that sort of shaped whether or not I would potentially be able to crack it as an entrepreneur. So um, let's, let's get into this real quick. We're going to follow this sort of outline here. Let's go to the next slide for just a second. I'm going to try and touch briefly on a ton of stuff. We're going to like rapid fire through this stuff. All of these things sort of formed, they, they played at least a minor role um, for me in my ability to be at least somewhat successful as an entrepreneur. They're pretty ordinary stuff. Like I had a daughter, I had a son, I got married, I served a mission, that sort of stuff. But let's, let's go ahead and start from the top. Let's go to the next slide real quick. I was born here in Provo. This is my childhood home in Orem, Utah. It's uh, sort of at the mouth of Provo Canyon. Um, 2,200 square foot home. I slept in my brother's closet for a few years. Shared a water bed with my older brother. My parents were pretty frugal. Um, and this was, this was uh, the house I lived in until I was a junior in high school. So the day, from the day I was born until I was a junior in high school, my parents got really ambitious and decided, let's move. When I was a junior in high school, my two older brothers were out of the house. My younger sister was still in the house, obviously. Uh, we moved three blocks east um, to a, a different home. Um, it, was, it was a nicer home, more space, now that my parents didn't need it. Um, and uh, that, only in Utah, of course, that's not a new stake, but it was a new ward. Um, and from a very early age, I got really into sports. That was sort of my thing. Um, I was really into, so I, really every sport, but I kind of fell deeply in love with soccer. Um, I played goalkeeper. Does anyone here play soccer? Do I look like a, your typical goalkeeper? No, no why? Short. Yeah, I'm sure. I've got like <laughs> T-Rex arms, right? So one thing that soccer taught me, it taught me that you have to work your butt off. Um, especially if you're five foot eight and you want to be a goalkeeper. I had to learn to play the game differently because I had some physical limitations. So what I did is I spent a ton of time at the gym, not to like beef up my upper body, it was to like build my hamstrings and anything that would affect my jumping ability and my quickness. I got to the point where I was a senior in high school and I could get this close to dunking on a 10 foot hoop which I was pretty proud of. I felt like, hey, I'm, I'm a white guy that can almost dunk on a 10-foot hoop, and I'm 5'8". I should pat myself on the back for that. But um, that's one thing that soccer taught me. The second thing it taught me is a lot of lessons in leadership. I was, uh, for whatever reason, was asked to be the captain of many of the teams that I was on. And some of my coaches were a little bit more strict on what your role was as a captain. Others, it was basically just... You're involved in the coin toss and stuff like that. But some of them wanted you to actually follow up with your teammates on the stuff they should be working on at home. You're supposed to actually help with like pregame warm up and warming the team up at practice. And you're supposed to actually like crack the whip a little bit and get your teammates going. And uh, that was, soccer was kind of my first foray into that kind of aspect of life, being a leader. Uh, the last thing that I think is meaningful that soccer taught me was it taught me how to work as a team. It taught me how to be held accountable and to hold teammates accountable. It taught me that I am going to be relied upon as a goalkeeper, especially if I make a mistake, we all lose, right? It was a really, really good thing for me. It made me feel like a huge burden every single day, um, especially in games to, to make sure that I was doing my job. So I'm super grateful for it. Um, I think it, it, oddly enough, played a pretty impactful role in my life, and I'm really grateful that I did it, um, even now that I'm 33 years old. 
I'm now uh, force feeding soccer on my two boys, um, eight years old and six years old. Um, let's go to the next slide. Another significant part of my upbringing was being a slave for my dad. Um, my dad is a plumber. Um, has anyone ever done plumbing before? Not like plunging your toilet, but like legit plumbing. So my dad was a plumbing contractor, which was slightly different from like a service plumber. We didn't go and do very much service work, like repairing a water heater or like messed up drains. We did new construction mostly. In the late 90s, early 2000s, all the real estate, all the new construction was happening in Northeast Orem, some in Highland. We were really excited if we got a job in Highland because the ground was soft. Um, but also Linden and, and up there in the foothills on the benches there in Linden and Northeast Orem, it was absolute misery. So if, if you don't know how a house is built, the first thing that happens is you dig a hole, then you pour the foundation, you pour the footings, you don't pour the floor yet in the basement because you have to dig these trenches. It's not like sprinkler trenches. They're a little bit wider, generally a little bit deeper, and it sucks. It's the worst job ever. I, I hated it. My dad made me and my older brothers do this from the time we were 13, 14, clear until we left his house. It was sort of like your way of paying rent. And he underpaid us, and <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was the worst. It was seriously so bad. We, we hated my dad for it. But um, whether it was 120 degrees or 20 degrees outside, you're digging, whether you like it or not. And we would get nasty blisters all over our hands. You throw out your back, and it didn't matter if you were hurt. You still have to go. And I just told you I played soccer, so I would get home at 4 or 5. Then I'd get on my bike because my dad wouldn't drive me to practice. And I'd ride my bike like three or four miles to practice. And then we'd do like conditioning in the summer after I'd just done that. And then all my buddies would want to go like run around, you know, that evening. And, and I was, you know, once like nine or ten rolled around. I'm like, dude, I'm ready for bed. And uh, those were my summers oftentimes. I would still, you know, do what it took to, to go out and have some fun in the evenings. But my dad made us work. Um, I, am, I get a little bit emotional when I talk about it because I hated it so bad. But I look at it now and I couldn't be more grateful that my dad made me do it. And we didn't have a choice. We started at 7 in the morning every summer. I mean, that's... that's so that's, not, that's like a significant wedge that gets between father and son, right? Um, I'm convinced that in my career, I've yet to work a day that rivals a pretty average day that my dad puts in. And I've worked really hard. Um, I attribute Mangum Plumbing to me having an endless motor. I don't burn out. I've worked with plenty of people that burn out. I don't have a burnout gene. And I think it's from my dad, and, and he built that in me. So I'm super appreciative of that. Um, let's go to the third, the third thing that um, sort of, I think, influenced me. Ever since I was a little kid, my parents were always really supportive of this. I love doing entrepreneurial things. I didn't look at it as me doing entrepreneurial things. But I would, I would hustle my neighbors and for money to mow their lawn. Uh, wash their windows, install or remove Christmas lights. I got a job at University Hyundai in Orem at the time um, as a lot attendant with one of my buddies. We were tasked with washing the cars after it rained or snowed. After like a two week stretch where it just didn't rain or snow, we got really bored. And so if, if we didn't have work to do, they just say, just don't come. And um, so we started coming anyways. They got a little bit curious why. It's because they had a big garage that would fit like two or three cars in. They had all the nicest like chemicals and equipment to detail cars with. And so we told all of our buddies, we'll detail your car for like 30 or 40 bucks. Bring your car, bring your moms, bring your dads. And then one of our buddies came and uh, went to our boss's desk and said, hey, uh, is Zach and Mason here? And he's like, like, why would somebody be asking for these guys? Because we weren't like salesmen. And he said, oh, I'm just here to get my mom's car detailed. And uh, so that was our last day of work. We got fired. It's the <laughs> only job I've ever been fired from. Um, I like doing this stuff. I sold insurance as a part-time job while I was in your guys' seat uh, to put myself through school. Um, I like the chase. I love it. I love chasing people. 
I love convincing them that they should buy something that they weren't sold on until I talked them into it. I get a huge amount. I just get a rush out of it. It's fun. If you don't, entrepreneurship isn't for you. I can promise you that because that's what makes the business go is sales and, and being aggressive on that front. Okay, last thing I want to talk about before I get into to like legit entrepreneurship talk um, is my mission. So I got home from my mission in 2004. I served in New York City. I wasn't called to go to New York City. I was called to go to Connecticut, uh, Portuguese speaking. And uh, two weeks into my mission, my mission president pulled me and seven missionaries aside. We were in the same district. And he said, you guys are effective immediately now in the New York, New York North mission because some state boundaries got realigned. And we thought, well, that sucks, but okay, we'll go ahead and do that. And uh, so we met our new mission president and um, I got paired up with a mission president about nine months after that, after the, the previous mission president had left, that I think for sure changed the rest of my life. He was an incredible man, is an incredible man. Um, taught me how far passion can get you. My mission taught me something new about work. Not necessarily that you need to work hard, but that you can totally put in a long day and it's okay. And working clear till nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever is okay. And that's, that's not going to kill anybody. Um, and, and I think it was a really, really good thing for me. Um, when I got home from my mission in 2004, let's go to the next slide. Um, life got super real for me. I had a different picture here and my wife saw what I put in. And so she texted me this one. She said I, that she didn't look good in the other one. So I think she looks great. Right guys. Um, so Carly and I got married in 2005. I got home from my mission July 2004. Um, I had known Carly since I was in eighth grade. We never dated. We didn't go to the same high school. She went to Provo High. I went to Orem High. Um, we shared a lot of, of mutual friends. One of my best friends was dating her best friend. And when I got home from my mission, we started spending time together. And uh, maybe four or five months after I got home, we started dating. And then we got married uh, I guess it was 13 months after I came home from my mission. I did not expect that that would happen that fast. I guess it sounds like a pretty prototypical LDS couple, uh, sort of shotgun wedding in the temple. <laughs> um, life got really real at that point, though. We're, I'm not providing for just me anymore. I'm providing for me and Carly and the children that we'll eventually have and the life that we want to have. And I was convinced, man, we're going to have an awesome life. Everything that I've had uh, happen to me up until that point in my life told me that you're going to have a cool life if you want to. Um, I was taught that way. Um, I was raised that way. I had had enough evidence in my life in the various activities that I, I'd taken part in that I can sort of create my own reality if I want to. It just depends on how much I'm willing to sacrifice and work for it. So... Um, Let's, let's go to the next slide. Indecision struck me right after that. I came to BYU. I didn't know what I wanted to study. I have two really smart brothers. One of them was just done at uh, Harvard Business School. Just got his MBA. Um, big shoes to fill. Super smart guy. Um, legitimately brilliant. He and my other brother. My other brother went, came here, got his uh, Mac degree. He was working at a big four accounting firm. Both super stable jobs, really great families. I'm sitting here thinking, I don't even know what I want to do, man. I go to accounting courses and I did well in my courses, but I was like, I just I don't even think I like this. I don't think I could do this. I go to finance courses. I think that's a little bit better, but not sure I want to do that. Maybe general business. And then I thought, I don't know, some of my friends that did that, and this was not a fair indicator or, or conclusion to draw, but I thought, they're all like working in sales. I'm not sure I want to go in sales. And so I was just super undecided. Um, but because of that, I decided maybe, uh, maybe I'll do law school. I thought, you're a pretty smart guy. Um, there's some good law schools here in Utah. BYU is a great one. The U's got a great law school. I thought, that's, that's probably a pretty good option. Um, so I studied for the LSAT. I thought, plus, you love to argue. Isn't that what an attorney does for a living? I'll be, I'll be great at this. 
And so I took the LSAT. I studied like crazy. Has anyone here taken the LSAT? It sucks, right? It's really bad. <laughs> so there's four sections, or at least there were when I took it. There's reading comp, which I was terrible at. Um, probably should be an attorney if you're not good at reading, right? Um, second was uh, critical reasoning, uh, or logical reasoning, something like that. Two sections that were the same. And you had to like find the logical errors in statements that people make. I was pretty good at that. Um, then the last section was games, these sort of like puzzles, like John, Harry, and Sally had a red, blue, and green hat, who wore what hat on what day, that sort of thing. That was my money section. I nailed it every time. And I, would take, I took these practice courses. I took a million practice tests. I was testing to where I would be like top 20 law school. My grades were good enough here at BYU. I felt really, really confident in my, my likelihood of at least getting into BYU or the U and maybe going out of state for school. I took the LSAT in the fall of, the, of 2007. Um, I, when I was done, I'm like, dude, I crushed it. I'm feeling really, really confident. They mail you your bubble sheet home. Um, in my money section, the game section, I got like four right. I'm like, this is a hoax, man. I was like ready to call him up. You're lying. This is not my bubble sheet. Anyway, what you're taught is if you get one wrong, skip it and come back to it later. So I skipped early on, like question two or three. I skipped it, but I put question four's answer in question three, and I was one off in the whole section. And so the only ones I got right were like the first two questions. And then I was one off. So I got the ones right where there's like two C's in a row. I got one of the two right. And I was, I was just about to graduate. So it was like, you got to wait the next round to apply. I applied anyway. Um, needless to say, nobody wanted me. Um, so <laughs> in the fall of 2007, I was getting close to graduation. Um, most people get pretty excited about the idea of graduating. I was a little bit like, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. I, I'm kind of like not sure where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do. I had lots of decisions to make. Do I do, uh, I, I just felt like I needed to have things figured out a little bit more. And so now I'm starting to interview. I'm interviewing at a bunch of different places. I'm graduating December 2007. It's fall. Like we're, we're these are my options. I had in, interviewed at a bunch of banks and was feeling pretty good about this option, although my brother had some classmates at, at Harvard that were like, dude, don't do it. It's really, really rough. Because I was married, my wife was pregnant. Um, it was kind of interesting circumstances for me. It felt safe, though. Like, that's going to set me up for sure. I'm going to be in a really good position if I do that. I also was really intrigued about, like, private equity, but on the real estate side, joining a firm that does that type of investing. But it was also, we were heading into 2008. Um, just for those of you who don't pay attention to history, that was a really bad time to think about anything related to investing or real estate. So I started uh, interviewing at some public corporations as a financial analyst. I, I forgot to mention, I decided to settle on doing finance as my major. Um, felt really safe there too, but the places I had interviewed, you could like hear a pin drop, and that was sort of like a personality I had a personality conflict there, um, but it did feel safe. Or I could join a startup. I felt like, hey, I'd like to be an entrepreneur at some point. Maybe that's where I'll go. I'll be a, I'll be a startup guy. But I knew that that's like a total crapshoot early on. I was not a code. I didn't code. I didn't, I didn't know how to do any like UI design or anything like that. And I was, technology seemed to be the right fit for a startup for me. And uh, I didn't do any of that. So I just had to be sort of like, a random, I'll do whatever you want me to do kind of guy if I were to do that. Um, so here's what happens. I'm interviewing at various investment banks. My wife, I graduated in 2007. My son was born January 2008. Um, that ruled out investment banking. Even though I served my mission in New York City, and that's where I wanted to go work, was on Wall Street, my wife was pretty logical. She said, Man, look at it from my, shoe, my position. Do you think I want to go live in New York City with no support system, friends, family, anything, a newborn baby while you go work 24-7 and sleep under your desk? I'm just sort of not that interested in that life. And I, I was kind of cool with whatever, but it felt like, yeah, I think Carly's right. So I decided not to. Um, 
what I decided to do um, was just keep interviewing. I got a great job offer at a public company up in Salt Lake. They do like three billion a year in revenue. Um, the job was to be a uh, financial analyst. And my offer was literally like 30 to 40% better than what my peers were getting, even in a really crummy economy. So I was like, holy cow, I gotta take this and run. I accept the offer, great benefits, great bonus package, like everything was, you'd be stupid to not take this offer. So I took it. Then I had interviewed at a couple startups. The next day, one of them uh, pinged me and said, we'd like to, to hire you as well. So I had lunch with them just to ask them, like, let's walk me through the details. So their, their way of competing with this great offer I got was to say, we'll give you about half of what you're guaranteed at the other company. Uh, no benefits, no bonus, but man, if you do really well, if we have a good year, like you could maybe do a little bit better than that other offer. And so of course I decided to go work at the startup. Um, my wife and I, it was, it was a really emotional decision for us, really spiritual decision for us. That decision, uh, I wouldn't be talking to you today if it weren't for that decision. That was one of the biggest decisions of my life. Don't take lightly what job you take when you graduate. Think about what you want to do and think about where you might want to end up. I took, these, the, I took the worst option and it was the best option for me. I think that the Lord sometimes tells you to do something really irrational. And when I'm feeling a prompting to do something really irrational, I get sort of excited because it feels like something good might come of this. Um, this was definitely one of those cases. So after my son was born, um, I ended up starting my first day of work. I, I worked for this company called Funding Universe. This company is now called Lendio. Um, anyway, what they did before they were Lendio is they would hook up uh, startups with investors. What Lendio does now is they help them find financing through banks, which is a great move that they made. At the time, though, it was a young company. I was the sixth employee. Um, I was asked to do a little bit of everything. My first day of work, they didn't even have a desk for me yet. Um, I set up my own cubicle on my first day. They had a headset for me. I'm like, no, I'm not that guy. But I put on my headset and smiled and went to work. Um, I immediately started contacting everybody I'd interviewed with before and said, hey, uh, just kidding. If you want to talk again, I think I made the wrong decision. Um, too late. And the economy got only worse. My prospects got fewer and fewer. And uh, here we go. It's time, to, time to, to get real with this job. So I, I kind of put a smile on my face, went for it. Um, let's go to the next slide. This job like literally changed my life. I talked to entrepreneurs every day because they were trying to find funding. And I would find these guys, I, I, I learned this really interesting lesson. Uh, dumb people and smart people can run successful businesses. Um, that's not fair of me to say dumb people, but people that didn't seem like they had it all together. Um, they at least seemed that way. <laughs> they, they, I, I had to interview these CEOs of startups and I looked at their financials, I'd look at their presentation materials, everything about their business. I thought, dude, this guy, has, his business is like, he's got it together. And I swear I'm smarter than this guy. What am I doing? What, I, so I got this like irrational confidence that you could do this, dude. You could totally do this. So I had lunch with a couple of buddies. We decided, yeah, we can crack this. So in 2009 or so, um, there's a business called Family Link that had built this Facebook app called We're Related. It was a way to build like a family tree through a Facebook app. You guys for sure don't remember those days. This was a while ago. Um, but Facebook apps were kind of a big deal back then. And you could make a lot of money through ad revenue. And they were driving a ton of traffic. We talked to their uh, team that built the We're Related app. It had 65 million monthly active users. And they said, we'll help you build an app. And we all grew up playing soccer together, so we're like, let's do one that's like the same thing, but instead of building your family tree, you put together like your team's roster, and you can communicate together, and hey, if this dude that built We're Related is gonna help us with it, this will work. And he seemed pretty confident that it would work. Um, next slide. We didn't have any money, so I just used the credit I had. That was stupid. 
Um, so I spent a lot of money that I didn't have. My dad was a plumber, not necessarily like the wealthiest guy in the world. Um, my partner's dad was in real estate and the real estate market had sort of fallen out from underneath everybody. So we didn't have like anyone to lean on except for ourselves and we didn't have money, but we did have some room on some credit cards. And at Funny Universe, I learned some tricks about how you could get an unsecured line of credit even if you had no business history. And so I thought he's pretty smart and we'd get some room on some credit cards and instantly regretted that one. Um, so let's go to the next slide. What happened there is we got this, it was called Rain or Shine Soccer, horrible name. Um, but we, we got it to the, and we were gonna do Rain or Shine football and basketball and baseball and we kind of build these like niche micro social networks. Um, anyway, because we built it and we got the soccer site to the point, or the app to the point that we could actually market it, but we had no money, we thought, all right, we have to like find a way to make money. Our day jobs were paying the bills and like putting food on the table barely and servicing some debt that we had, to, that we shared in. Um, outside of that though, we didn't have a single dime to market this rain or shine soccer thing. And so we thought, hey, in the process of building this, we've learned a ton and we had about marketing on Facebook and getting an audience on Facebook and what are the fundamentals to making something go viral on Facebook. This is again, 2009 bleeding into early 2010 and businesses are now starting to flock to Facebook, big enterprises especially. Small businesses were still kind of new to this thing. We thought, let's do like the promotion, sweepstakes, contests, giveaway thing on Facebook, but do it for small businesses. I think we could do that. So I got really excited about it. This was like a day or two of talking about it. I go to GoDaddy, I search for G-R-O-W, S-O-C-I-A-L, it's already taken, so I shaved off the W, it's available, let's buy it. So we built this crummy website on WordPress and Girl Social was live. So um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Shortly after my son's born, my second son, life got terrifying. Now I've got two kids and my wife to provide for. We have no money. Let's hope this, this gross social thing works out. Let's go to the next slide. Um, okay, so gross social, what we did is we did social media marketing consulting. Think of like a typical marketing company. We did that, but we only did it on Facebook. That's all we did. We're not gonna help you with SEO, nothing. It's like sweepstakes, contests, that sort of thing. A lot of what we would do though is because we wanted to get some sort of like economies of scales, we get these uh, groups of entrepreneur or uh, uh, business owners together and we do a webinar and consult them all as a group. And the only time we could do that was in the evenings because we had day jobs. And my wife, to help us like survive, she grew up dancing, so she taught dance to some like junior high and high school age girls while I would watch our two boys at home and do webinars. The only room that was open that was quiet enough because I could close the door was the bathroom. So I would do webinars from the toilet. Like, like Buddy right here, I literally was on the toilet teaching people how to do social media marketing. Um, and you're just thinking, what in the world am I doing right now? Um, anyway, um, let's move on. We got to the point where we had enough customers though and we found some resellers. We talked these resellers into selling our services under their name, but we would fulfill on it. And we thought, holy cow, this is actually working. We just don't have any money left at the end of the month. We might make like 10 to 12,000 bucks in a month. We don't get to keep any of it because we have to spend that much paying all the people that we're using on the back end to like fulfill on building these little apps for Facebook pages of our customers and doing some design work. We thought, what if we could just automate this? So we looked for and found a CTO through a, an insane like crazy uh, turn of, e of events and mutual contacts, we met this guy, ends up becoming our CTO. Um, that led me to say, I think I'm confident enough to like ditch my day job. I had met an investor at Grow Social, uh, or I'm sorry, at, Infu at, goodness, at Funding Universe, who I talked into giving us $50,000 into an investment. And so I decided that, yeah, I think this might actually work, let's do it. So I sort of jumped off the cliff and uh, decided that I was gonna be an entrepreneur. Um, and miraculously, it was able to work. Um, things kind of came together. We were really excited about what was going on. Um, we were getting more and more customers. It's like, holy crap, we did it guys. Like this is, this is working. And 
the real story about Grow Social, I could tell you all about the strategic moves we made and we did this right and we did that right. No, you just kind of get lucky, man. You just do. But getting to this point, everything that I've talked to you about up to this point is what really mattered. What happened after that, we had sort of created this culture of like, plow through anything and don't stop and don't give up. And no matter how terrified you are and how scared you are, just keep going. If you don't give up, if you, every one of you guys in here, I promise, if you're at this school, I'm already confident enough to say you can crack it as an entrepreneur. I was like the least of you. <laughs> I can promise you that. I am not a, an, I am a very ordinary guy. And I have not done anything in my life up to this point that like separates me from the average Joe. And I would venture to say that you all scored higher than me on your SAT or ACT. Your intellectual horsepower, I would venture to say you all beat me by a lot. The one area that maybe you don't, maybe, is I can outwork anybody. And if you're willing to just not give up, things go well and things end up working. Um, you just have to will something to, to that point, I think, at some point. So we started this business in October 2010. That's when I sort of like said, all right, I'm gonna do this. Worked out of our CTO's basement. Um, that, was, that was the worst. Anyway, um, we raised just under $2 million in venture capital, which we're pretty proud of because most businesses have to raise a lot more than that before they're acquired. Um, we sold the business just barely over two years after we all started doing it full time. Um, we were really excited about that. We delivered really awesome returns to our investors, which put me in a position to be able to do something again and start a new business where a lot of investors that I had worked with with Grow Social were really excited to invest in the new business because of, of the track record um, that my team and I had, had showed them through Grow Social. We were acquired by a really cool business called Infusionsoft. They're sort of like Salesforce, but for small businesses. They do marketing automation, um, CRM type software, and they wanted a way to, in to inject some more like modern marketing with, with social media marketing. They acquired us in December uh, 2012, right before Christmas. That was a really cool day. Um, changed my life forever, for sure. Uh, I stayed on board with Infusionsoft for two years and uh, joined their executive team, which was really cool to go from 18 guys in Orem to like 600 plus people in Utah and Arizona and in the UK um, and work as a part of a big pre-IPO company and have a seat at that table when I was 29 years old was like just a, an unreal cool experience that Again, when I was in your guys' shoes, this was like less than five years after I was in your guys' shoes and I'm, I'm working in that, that role. I thought that was just such an awesome opportunity. Super grateful for it, learned so much. I got to the point though where I thought it's time to do something else. Big company was, was something I saw I could do maybe as I get older, but I, was, I felt like I was still young enough that it's not time to coach, like I still got some game in me. I need to be on the court. And so I decided to start a new venture called Hit Labs. We're building an app called Bubble right now. Um, those of you who are on iOS, download it. You wanna search Bubble Chat probably. Um, there are tons of games that have the name Bubble in it. We're almost live on Android. This is a, has anyone here used Slack before? This is like Slack, but not for the business place, for friends instead. Um, we've got some really cool stuff going on. Since I think this is filmed right now, is it? Are we being filmed? Yeah. Okay, so I probably shouldn't say some things, but there, we've, we've signed deals with some really cool celebrities. Uh, I'll hint at one is like the biggest one or two basketball players in the world. We just signed a contract with um, one of the biggest entertainment celebrities on the planet. We just signed this week, which we're really excited about. Lots and lots of cool stuff that we're going to be using. You'll be able to get in a group chat with friends and have somebody like Steph Curry join your conversation with just you and your buddies, which is super cool. We're, we think it's a pretty innovative thing that we're doing. We decided let's get out of SaaS and let's all go do something we've never done before. We're, we're doing something that we feel super ambitious. We're going to try and be, by a landslide, the biggest consumer app to ever come out of Utah. And we want to put Utah on the map. 
We've got a bunch of BYU guys on our team. We want it to put BYU on the map. That's sort of a, a mission that we have in building this, and hopefully we're successful in doing it. Let's move on. Just a couple bits of advice as we close. I get asked all the time if I would go to lunch with you type of thing. People will hit me up on LinkedIn, or they'll get my email address, or get, in, get introduced to me by somebody, and they'll say, I want to pick your brain about a couple of things. I'm thinking about starting a business. My advice, don't waste your time doing stuff like that. Just do it. What worked for me, what worked for any other entrepreneur does not necessarily mean it will work for you. Just go get dirty. Go jump off the cliff and find and build your parachute on the way down. If you don't give up, it'll work. It'll work. Just have the guts to do it. Next thing, get feedback early and often. Um, I'll do that right now. Download Bubble. My email is Zach, Z-A-C-H, at hitlabs.com. Write it down. Download the app. If you have iOS, Android's, I don't know how far away it is, maybe a week or two. iOS, though, is ready. Download it. Create a group. It could be like just a group of your buddies. It could be like if you play on an intramural team of some, or something together, your classmates, a group here at school, your family, something like that. That's what you'll do. You create a group. And you start chatting with your buddies in there. Give me, send me an email in the next like five or seven days. Tell me three things that you would change with the app. This is how you get feedback and advice as an entrepreneur. You don't get it by saying, hey, Zach, I'm just like, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? The feedback you want to do, go build something and then go ask people, what do you think? What should I change? What do you think? What do you think I should do differently? How could I do this better? So that's me actually practicing what I preach here. Next. Um, I'll just end with this. Seek, seek first the kingdom of God. Don't let your business take over your life. I made that mistake for sure from time to time. Um, fight like crazy for balance in your life. Don't neglect your spouse. Don't neglect your kids. Things that you think have to get done today can always get done tomorrow. They seriously can. Have a strict cutoff. Be a good person. Um, don't just care about your family, care about your neighbors, care about your community, care about the ward and stake you live in. Um, give meaningful service. The Lord will magnify you if you do. Don't cut out scripture study. Don't cut out those things. Be really, really engaged in living the gospel. And uh, my, my experience and testimony is that the Lord actually makes up for the minutes that you're spending doing those things by somehow magnifying the fewer minutes that you have in the day to do good and to do good in your business. Um, I think that's it. So I think we'll probably go somewhere else for questions. Okay, thanks guys.